On today's Locked On Royals Padres crossover part one for the week, we're going to talk about Eric Hosmer, a bond between these two franchises that will not soon be forgotten. How his tenure in Kansas City and San Diego was totally different in every shape of the way. We'll talk about that coming up on today's Locked On Royals podcast. You are Locked On Royals. Your daily Kansas City Royals podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. get it going on the lockdown royals padres crossover episode here for you today talking on the lockdown royals feed talking on the lockdown padres feed it's myself relin styles and javier reyes over Ooh. there in the corner I have a pinion on twitter i'm relin styles on twitter and javi thank you so much for making us your first listen for the second listen check out the lockdown prospects they're there for you talking all mlb prospects so locked on mlb prospects over there javi how are you doing today first and foremost I'm doing fantastic. I feel electric. The only thing, Rylan, that I regret is that for longtime listeners and viewers of the podcast, I was unable to find where my, the subject of today's podcast, my City Connect shirt for one Sir Eric Hosmer, the Wizard of Haas, as you so eloquently called him back in the day. Uh, I unfortunately couldn't find it. That is an epic, epic shirt of mine. I will, and by the time the season starts, we'll talk about why it's so important. But, man, I am doing great, and I am so excited to do this roast. I mean, we did it back in the day. We talked about Hosmer, a, a, a relic of your past, right? And one that was a, a blemish on my present, you know? And I think that it's going to be a lot of fun to talk about this and take a little bit of the break of the everyday minutia of spring training and roster predictions and world baseball classic. Well, the latter most is pretty cool, but you get my point. And I am super happy to be here. Well, you mentioned this before. So we did this, we did this after the first year of the Hosmer Padres contract, where it looked like a complete disaster. Then Hosmer had a pretty nice season and we kind of uh, forgave him for his San Diego tenure. <laughs> and then last year happened and it all went back to crap. So Javi, uh, as we open up this third year of an Eric Gosmer discussion, <laughs> you call it a roast, I'll call it a discussion. Uh, mm. I, I think it's time for me to be honest with you, Javi. Mm. Uh, the Wizard of Haas nickname that I that I uh, so coined in our group chat whenever uh, you guys were playing, I believe it was the Cardinals in the playoffs. And he had runners in the scoring position, but there was yeah. also a runner on first. <laughs> yeah. And he was and, and he was off the bat, and I said... The Wizard of Hods is going to pull off a, gr a ground out double play to end the game because that's just what the Wizard of Hods does. And sure enough, that's what he did. And you just fell in love with the Wizard of Hods nickname. It's time for me to come clean. That is a nickname that every Kansas Cityan knows. So uh, I appreciate you giving me the credit for it, but uh, that's been that's been a long standing tradition here in Kansas City. Oh man, it was actually pretty iconic. And people might say, "Oh, you jinxed us!" And Javi, did that upset you? No, because it was Eric Hosmer. And while I will say that in the 2020 season, somehow was probably his best season for the Padres, that 2020 season, which is nuts, and we'll get into that later. He had actually been good at that point, so I was a little annoyed. But the bottom line is, you were right. I mean, this is what he does. And I think that what's so important to talk about, and I've done another episode of my own on this, is like, the reason Eric Hosmer became so maligned, the reason he became literally a banned word on my show around the horn style. I refuse to say his name on the podcast for an entire, I believe season and a half. It's not just because he didn't play for uh, just because he played poorly. It is so much deeper than that. There are so many other layers to it. And I think that that is something that outside fan bases might not totally grab. It's not just because he was bad. There's a bunch of things that kind of coalesce together, this amalgamation of awful. And I think that as a result, turned him against uh, or the, turned the fan base against him in a pretty record time. If you think about it, you, you know what I mean? Like there's Steven Strasburg is out here, not being able to pitch fans don't care. You know what I mean? There's, there's plenty of overpaid players out there that don't really do too much. I never saw Justin Upton getting a lot of crap for the angels. You know what I mean? 
there's a lot of different things with Eric Hosmer, and I'm excited to uh, dive in every direction about the Hosmer, the Wizard of Haas, or as a listener of my show, and I believe Anthony Burris is, um, was the one who coined it, the Ground Ball Gremlin, as we call him on my show. The Ground Ball Gremlin. <laughs> Look, there, there's a lot that goes into it. And, and the, the first thing I want to launch off with what you just said, the quick turn from the Padres fan base on Hosmer from from going from, wow, this is a statement signing, like so cool. You had the Scott Boris press conference on MLB Network. Uh, it felt like the Padres were, were going to make a move with Preller and everything uh, to just being absolutely hated, hated in, in, in San Diego. I think that that is the quickest we've seen a player fall off of fan favoritism whenever, especially you attach it to the team's success. Like it wasn't as though he was the worst contract in baseball and the Padres were the worst team in baseball. And this was a complete and utter disaster from a team level. Most of the time winning cures all most of the time, you know, you can head into um, a season and if a guy is getting overpaid and a guy is uh, not, cr- not producing the magic that, that you want him to, but the team is winning, then all is well for the most part until the off season. Then we realize how bad of a season it was. For, for Hosmer, he never got the benefit of, he just never got the benefit of the, the team winning or the doubt or like out of sight, out of mind. Why do you think that that was? Oh boy. Oh boy. Here we go. Here we go. I think what's so important to note about Eric Hosmer is in fairness to him, the only thing that, sh- that can possibly be given any favor towards him has nothing to do with him as a player, but the fact that the Padres messed up. This was a guy who was known for having an every other year type of career from the beginning. 1.1 F4. Just if we're, we're going to use F4 just to quickly go through it. In his first year, negative 1.3 the next year, 3.1 the next year, negative 0.2 the next year, 3.5 the next year, then zero, then 3.8, the best of his career, coincidentally, as it's his last season, his last season with the Royals, when he has a really good slash line, he slugs 498. Right. Like he had 25 bombs, really solid season for a guy who had just won a World Series. Right. So it's it's was one of those contracts, the rare contract that almost universally everybody when it got announced was like, oh, my God, like this is bad. When Xander Bogarts gets announced, everyone's like, oh, love it. But hey, it could get a little bit bad later on. That's the case with a lot of deals. This is not exclusive to Hosmer. But what was exclusive was the vibe of me not even fully covering the Padres at the time being like, Oh my God, what? Like the first year was a question with him because of what I just mentioned about him being. So every other year, his whole career. And it reminded me of uh, say, you know, I live on the East coast, the reaction to Jacoby Ellsbury signing with the Yankees. Everyone immediately was like, why for this guy? It feels like you're just going out there to get a free agent, to get a free agent. Some cases to be made, maybe signing him made them more of a destination Maybe it means they landed Machado because of it. I don't know. I feel like that's a little bit more hearsay and it's a little bit more like you're being more liberal and giving Hosmer more credit if you want to be easy on him. But man, it's just, Rylan, I mean, there's so many aspects to this story. And I think that what's so funny is, like you said, he's kind of a hero with the Kansas City Royals. He's famous for a bunch of things. You could talk about that real quick, like the his glory in the world series and in the playoffs in general, he has had good playoff numbers before part of that being because guys who have, or just have the ability to put the ball in play rather than home runs tend to have some more clutch stats attached to them. If you look this up, but man, it must've been nice. I feel like while he was with the Royals, at least in terms of just being, being a nice reminder of the world series that you guys won. So I think that this is a good way to break it up because I do have another question for you about the Padres tenure, because when you look at his Royals tenure, mm-hmm. he was the face of the Royals farm system, like the, the the rejuvenation of Kansas City. Him and Mustakis, like they were on covers of magazines. Um, they they were going to lead this farm system back, which a farm system that at the time, uh, while he would he and Mustakis were on magazines at the time, was without a doubt unanimously considered by every prospect evaluator out there, from Keith Law to anyone else, mm-hmm. as not only the best farm system in current day baseball, but the potential to be a historic farm system. So that's the level of hype or the level of, of expectation that was put on him. And he comes to the big leagues. 
there's an entire day called Eric Hosmer Day in Kansas City where everyone floods the streets, celebrates, and gets called up. It, it's incredible. And, and pretty soon thereafter, pretty soon thereafter, the Royals start to get better. 2012, better. 2013, they were in it to the last weekend uh, that they went to Seattle. And I stayed up late watching that series. Luckily, it was a weekend series. You know, I stayed up late watching that series. Uh, I think it was a weekend series. Either way, my dad let me stay up late uh, watching that series. And they got knocked out of contention. But it was the it was the furthest that they've ever made it in my lifetime to that point was two weekends before the season ended in Seattle. And he was a big, big charge of that. And then he goes and helps you get to the World Series in 14. You lose. Helps you win the World Series in 15 with the most iconic play in... Royals World Series history, I would I would say. Again, I'm only 25 years old, so I, I don't have as much credibility as as an older fan would. But you know, the the, the controversial call against the Cardinals, you know, that's that's up there as well. But the mad dash home from Eric Cosmer is not only iconic in Royals lore, uh, but it's a play that is iconic in Mets lore. It's a play that's iconic in baseball uh, of just encapsulating how that team played for two years. They zigged when everybody else zagged. They went and, and put the ball in play. They went and ran station to station. Uh, they capitalized on aggressive base running whenever everybody's just saying, well, let's just wait till we hit a home run or strike out. They went and took what was theirs. They went and took that World Series in those moments, and he was at the center of it. On top of playing really good defenses at first base, uh, obviously it's hard to quantify its first base, uh, but you know he won a couple of gold gloves. He was awesome at first base uh, for his Royals tenure. And after that World Series, if you remember comes the World Baseball Classic, where Eric Hosmer sneakily was one of the biggest contributors in the uh, USA winning the World Baseball Classic. Like, that happened. Like, he was not only, in, in a span of a year, he helped his personal MLB team win a World Series, and he helped the country win the World Baseball Classic. On top of all that, he has the look. He, he, he's a good-looking guy. He's marketable. He uh, is in line for a big contract. He's represented by Scott Boris. Like, everything is on top of the world for him, even despite the flaws that have always been there for him. He's always grounded up too much. He's always not cared about launch angle. He's always, you know, not been the perfect baseball player, but it felt like he was because, you know, he looks good when he's doing it. Uh, he's helping you win games. And then... He goes and signs that contract with San Diego and that devilish smile is now put into a larger, you know, or, or more recognizable uh, market on the West coast. Uh, and nothing goes right since then. It's like for Kansas city, he was a superstar. He's going to be a Royals hall of famer and he has a shot. Now, now again, uh, Royals historians would, would have a better shot at this piece a shot at being a guy who has his Jersey number retired. I think they're going to retire somebody from that core uh, you know, especially Alex Gordon, uh, Salvador Perez as well. So then if you already have two from that core, how many more do you want to keep going? Uh, if that makes sense. But regardless, Eric Cosmer will never be forgotten in Kansas city for all the right reasons. And it seems like he'll never be forgotten in, in Padres history for all of the wrong reasons. But one reason that you should never forget to go to Fandle.com is because it's the best sports book in America. Fandle.com slash locked on is there for you to help you bet on sports. We're at the midway point of the NBA season. It's time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Folks, go check it out today because new customers get up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet does not win. You can download the FanDuel app because it's safe, offers fast withdrawal, secure, super easy to use. And go right now, FanDuel.com slash lockdown. Let's go together. Let's go together. Type on the uh, NBA page and boom, you can bet Thunder Rockets tonight. Thunder are... 10-point favorites, you can bet on the World Baseball Classic. Right now, Team USA, the favorite to win the World Baseball Classic again. And even the World Series, where the Houston Astros are the favorite. Javi, go check out FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. We're back from that break. We're back. I'm locked on Royals and Padres. So, Javi, I just laid out how at the moment he put pen to paper, in San Diego, <laughs> Eric Hosmer was riding an all-time high personally, an all-time high professionally, and one of the biggest highs of any baseball player in the world. How did it go from that to what happened in San Diego? All right. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. The first thing to talk about is just the overall output with Eric Hosmer. If you wanted to look at just 
players who are making as much money as him. His San Diego Padres tenure, because I'm not as interested in breaking down the stats. You already mentioned ground ball stuff. Launch angle was infuriating, right? That's the whole thing. First year with the Padres, negative 0.5 F4. Second year with the Padres, negative 0.9. 2020, his best season with the Padres, truncated to 20, 0.F4, which is actually really good when you take into account that it was 2020 truncated season and he only played 38 games, which is wild. And then the year after that, he follows it up with 0.6 and then 0.3 in total with two teams in this past season, 2022. It's also the contract. Getting paid eight years, $144 million, all that money on a team that is trying to break break baseball almost, right? Oh, the Padres are spending money. What's going on? They're trying to transform themselves, and he's actively holding them back. That's absolutely true. And again, the launch angle stuff. And the launch angle is where I want to use to transition to the next point, which is narratives. I still remember after 2020, in those 38 games, Eric Hosmer was slugging the ball. Everyone was getting excited. They were like, oh, my God, old dogs learn new tricks, right? And it, it was it was astounding. And everyone said, oh, my God, all right, maybe he can at least be okay. He can be a one-and-a-half win guy, maybe a two-win guy, if maybe he cleans up some of his defensive stuff. Padres fans start getting excited. And let's be honest, won some fans over because he was the last home run, or I should say the last grand slam that gave them that Slam Diego nickname and broke that record for most consecutive grand slams. So that earned him a little bit more like favor among fans, I think. But one of the interesting things about him is that it's this this narrative thing. I still remember viewing and reading the San Diego Union Tribune piece before the 2021 season that basically made it sound like, oh, no, this is for real. Like he is, you know, you got Kevin Acey doing interviews, Jeff Sanders, all these guys doing these interviews and talking to him and being like, no, this wasn't just some flash in the pan. He knows I need to do this more. And then what happened, Rylan? What happened? <sighs> he absolutely did not learn from it. <laughs> he absolutely did not. Um, in terms of his launch angle in 2020, it was at, let's see if I can find it here. It was at 8.7, which was by far the highest of his career. Year after that, into this 2021 season, after we are being told how great of a leader he is and how much he's learning and doing things different, back down to 3.3. And then this past year, 3.1. I'm not saying that that 8.7 was incredible, but it's just one little thing. So fans are really frustrated. Why the heck did you start? going back to what you did before, after getting a taste of fans liking you, you go right back to the grab ball stuff. And that gives him the gremlin nickname, right? But it goes even deeper than that. The overall, and I'm going to avoid getting into the hyper-political and racial politics of all this, but media was overwhelmingly soft on him. This is a guy that was rarely being pestered for questions. And anytime he was... You know, you have some people coming out. I know that on Padres Twitter, Kevin AC is infamous for this after he gets traded, which we'll get into a little bit later. You know, he's breaking down in tears practically, gets choked up on a podcast with how great and good of a guy he is. The problem with Eric Husmer was how much you had local media outlets. Not all of them, though. I don't want to make this a crap on reporters thing. They're doing a great job. How much they were telling us how great he was instead of us actually seeing it. And I think that created this disconnect between fans and the media and the team, where even the team at times, Manny Machado before the 2022 season, saying, I'm going to be an unhappy man if Eric Cosmer gets traded. Okay, cool. Why are all these players feeling so emboldened and, and media and whatever to go out publicly, not behind the scenes and be, damn, I really like this guy. I don't like that they're going to trade him. Being emboldened by a guy who has an F4 that's one of the worst among all of baseball ever since he got signed. It started to create this. Now, Manny, at least, is Manny Machado, and he plays well. So he he's able to avoid the criticism. But you have all these guys coming out, and we're like, what's going on? Like, you're creating this vibe that people, that they just don't care. That the team doesn't care because he's a good guy. The the ex-leadership. I know you don't like expected stats, but ex-leadership on Eric Hosmer, according to all the reports, is absolutely through the roof. And I think that it is it is the kind of... The, the being soft on him and never really being on him. And meanwhile, I mean, Tatis gets destroyed rightfully and all these players get destroyed and criticized all the time. And you're just looking at this saying, well, what's going on here? You know what I mean? Everyone's just destroying this guy. And I, I, I don't know why it's not happening for Eric Cosmer. 
at least not the same way. I'm not saying that he should be persecuted and destroyed in the media. I'm just saying it's very interesting that he wasn't. And then, as a result of all that, this is very important. The setting the stage of all and all this stuff you have when he gets traded to the Mets before it's 22 season, and then Manny's quote comes out and all this stuff. And I think another thing, which is what rubbed people a long way, is the overall body language. This is really important. The way he played obviously was bad. But when you look this man up, <laughs> when you look this man, I don't know if it's still the case. It might just be because of my personal YouTube account. If you type in Eric Hosmer, for me right now, the second video is Eric Hosmer is the worst player in baseball is the title of that video. And it is a collection of all of his highlights and defensive errors. Everyone always loves bringing up, especially in media, especially among baseball prognosticators. Well, he's got all the gold gloves. He's great. Meanwhile, if you watch him, he has made the most astoundingly weird amount of errors. I'm not just saying, ah, he scoop, he missed the scoop. I'm not saying it's, oh, he dropped the ball. It's like Hassan Kim in the outfield because of the shift, throwing the ball and Eric Hosmer is tracking it like he's a football player waiting for the ball to get to him. No, 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 no. That's not how baseball works. You see the ball get by you, you run to first base, plant, put the glove out. And then, oh, Tatis, he's he, all these throwing errors. I wonder how many of those are throwing errors if it wasn't, you know, Harry Cosmer playing first base. And then the last thing about the body language, you can see there's the, that, that, that Eric Cosmer, the worst player in baseball video, the end of it is him doing this like funny little, ooh, like smoking a joint type of face, like poking fun at it. His body language looked like he didn't care. And I'm not saying he didn't, but fans put two and together. You make a ton of money. There's no way that's going anywhere. You're going to get your contract. The eight years, 144 million. And you have first base lockdown. All the players seemingly are behind you. And then every time you make a mistake, you're having these little facial reactions. And then you're never really confronting or talking to anyone about it. There was never a time when, say, uh, after conference, when the Padres had their collapse in 2021, that Eric Hosmer came out and had a moment that really showed fans, oh, yeah, he's a great leader. Instead, it was media people telling you. It was all these other people telling you. And it's, it's like, did he ever care about being in San Diego? And one of the things I remember, Ben and Woods, and I've been talking for a really long time now, uh, Ben and Woods, really popular radio show in um, San Diego, very popular show. It's kind of like the voice of the people, the fan base. Not once did Eric Cosmer go on that show. They said this after he got traded, by the way. You go look it up. Um, Woods actually said this. Um, Stephen Woods, specifically. I should probably say his first name. Um, AJ Peller's been on the show. Manny Machado's been on the show. Jay Cronenworth's been on the show. This supposed incredible leader refusing to do that show is one of all these different points I've made that, again amalgamated to being why he became so hated it's not just the contract and how he played it was the body language it was the media defending him it was all these things and on a team that is trying to break out right and i think he he might have been one of those ones that was not lecturing but gave tatis like a little bit of the body language thing after he hit that grand slam on 3-0 that was a little bit of a bad thing but it just all coalesces into what we have now man and that's why he became so hated and that's why my friend when it was announced that this man was getting, and by the way, he couldn't even go out right. He refused the trade, which in fairness, that's on the Padres. You gave him the no trade clause. It is absolutely his right to do that. Every player, never worry about what the fans are going to think. You should exercise that. But because of that, it didn't do him any favors that because he refused to get trade to the Nationals, the Padres had to give up Luke Voigt instead who, not an incredible player, but he was a little bit of fan favorite. He's got the chest hair. He's doing the flex. He does the dumb beer chugging thing with water. And then you lose him too. So on his way out, he still found one more way to flip the bird to the fans. I almost did on the video. Whoops. Uh, but like, it's, I've been talking a lot. What do you think? <laughs> so I see, I see where it's coming from, from San Diego. And I see, and, and, and you've already addressed it. My question to you was going to be what happened to the whole launch angle thing? Because I, I distinctly remember you know, the season after his first one in San Diego, the stories coming out of like, oh, he's fixed it. He's fixed his launch angle. He's embracing it this year in spring training. Yeah, we've heard that before in Kansas City. But like the first two months, he was actually doing it. He was actually mm -hmm. really embracing launch angle. And I was like, wow, I wish we could have got that in Kansas City. And then it just never happened again. Mm -hmm. And so that was my, that was my question. You've already addressed that. Um, 
as far as the good guy stuff, I will say that that is something that came forward in Kansas City. Uh, it helps when you win championships, right? I mean, like he was, yeah. he was, he was at the bars paying for tabs and spraying fans with champagne and mm-hmm. doing all that fun stuff within the community in Kansas City. Uh, it's it's different whenever you whenever you're drafted there. It's different whenever you grow up there. It's different whenever you win championships there. Like so, all that's so different to where it's it's apples to oranges comparing the two. But but from everything that's happened in Kansas City, it does appear that if he has won over the you know, media there in, in San Diego, who's around him every day, then it is probably pretty genuine. He's the same way in San Diego, especially the clubhouse winning, getting one, one over by him as well. Um, I think that it's just a sad blip for him individually in San Diego. And I'm not sure that he ever recovers from it, but honestly, and let me know what you think about this. I think it was good for him to go there and suffer these down years rather than staying in Kansas city, getting paid a billion trillion dollars on an, on a team who could not recover from that. Had he signed that same deal in Kansas city and gave them that same lack of production, you could not recover from that as a team. Now you could be screaming at your, at your device right now saying, well, the Royals sucked anyway, since he left. So what does it matter that you're paying him at least, at least it's a familiar face. Yes. But now his Royals numbers, when you look back on it, it was like, wow, he did really good for Kansas City. Like now those are untouched. Now our lasting, our lasting memory of him is not what he's become in San Diego. It's winning the World Series. It's winning the World Baseball Classic. It's all of those fun things that we remember. We don't have to deal with this stuff, like this, this, this turn in his career. And whenever he comes back to Kansas City, he doesn't have to deal with that. When he comes back and he's at Kaufman. And, you know, he's getting a standing ovation in the box for the Red Sox last year. And whenever that, those things happen, he just feels, wow, I'm home. Wow, and this is where everything happened for me. He just feels good. He doesn't feel, yeah, this is where I was overpaid and and uh, was terrible. So, like, I think for him individually, you never want to struggle, but at least it happened in San Diego, a place where he can personally forget. I'm not calling your city forgettable. I'm saying where he personally can just move on, wash your hands. If it didn't happen in Miami, where he's from, it didn't happen in Kansas City, where he had his, where he had the majority of his career success. It happened in a city that he had no attachment to. They had no attachment to them, and you just kind of part ways in a sad, like, well, this didn't work. Exactly, exactly. And for the record, I did hear from literally people that I know, some sources that I know, like it is true, the locker room stuff, and I, I, I never doubt that, and that is important. The problem is when it wasn't also translating to success on the field and when it, you're literally resulting in negative numbers and this is a team that's having a collapse and everyone's like, yeah, but he's such a great guy. I think that's what rubbed people the wrong way. That's both media. That's both players. That's both fans to a degree. That's expectations. And it's uh, another like I remember when he was in trade rumors a couple of years ago. I think it was I think it was the 2021 season and he snapped at I believe it was Jeff Sanders of the San Diego Union Tribune. He asked a little bit of a weird question. I get it. I get it. Like, he was basically like, you know, how do you react to these rumors of of trade rumors and whatnot? All right, I get it. What do you think he's going to say? Okay. But that was like the first time he got asked that. And you immediately snapped. In comparison, and I forgot to mention this last thing, to Will Myers. A lot of other fan bases might be thinking, well, why wasn't Will Myers hated so much? He got brought in. He was a big contract. And he didn't perform all that well outside that Turkey to 2021. I swear on my life, he was the most clutch player I've ever seen in my life. I don't know what happened. That's because Myers, he was asked that and he was in trade rumors like for four years and never had that same vibe. He's taking pictures. He has that moment after they beat the Dodgers where he's buying everybody drinks at a bar. It's great. You know what I mean? He had this feeling of people still liked him. He was chill. He was relaxed. And even though he had all his questions, he handled it a lot more. Um, better meanwhile hosmer first time he gets asked about a trade flips out and i get that it was a weird question but this all of these things go together right where they look at myers and they're like at least he's like just chill it out you know what i mean at least he's not flipping out on people and i don't see the padres defending him nearly as much right and his f4 totals were actually a little bit better right and i and well javi he had a great start to 2022 yeah that's because he was extremely lucky put the ball on the ground a lot was hitting really well. Don't get me wrong. I'm grateful. Gave us some wins early on. But unless he was Ichiro Suzuki or Jeter or those fast players, that wasn't going to be sustainable. So it's just all these things coalescing into being why he was so maligned. And I think that it was something that I'm happy to be rid of. 
the Eric Hosmer City Connect uh, shirt was a gift from a friend of mine and also has been on the show before. Um, RM Layton, as well as some other people, Colby Olson, another one of them. And it was a gift, and he got traded like two days later. <laughs> so that shirt is being held in a in a, a treasure box, as far as I'm concerned, for the rest of my life. It is my good luck shirt wherever I go. I don't care if I'm taking the bar exam. I, I won't be. I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. But I don't care what it is. I am wearing that thing to every big thing of my life. I might even wear it at, at a wedding. At your might, wedding. Rylan, at my, at my wedding. If With your DC happens. woman. <laughs> yeah that's exactly right i might have to do that man might have to do that i don't know that's that's how much it means to me javi i forgot to mention on the highest of highs he also won an all-star mvp in kansas city which i believe happened mm-hmm. in san diego but mm-hmm. for kansas city so even the one thing he did great in your ballpark the world baseball classic and the all-star mvp mm-hmm. happened as a royal happened yeah. as a royal and not as a yep. padre he javi i hope that this allows you to get uh some some resolution on Eric Hosmer. Will he ever become a good player again? Absolutely possible. It's possible. In fairness, 33 this year, not the oldest in the world, low expectations on a rebuilding Cubs team, although those fans will certainly be pretty uproarious, but at least he's not making, you know, 87 million, right? If he was, the expectations would be higher. I think the jury's out on him, but look, I think he's one of those guys who's the epitome of great career, but a bad player if that makes any sense. This guy who has all these moments and those are important. And this is not the worst player of all time. He has the world series thing, the run to home play, the all-star MVP, the world baseball classic, all that stuff does matter. But in the end, I just, I just don't see it. There's been too many years when he just refuses to adapt. And I feel like we've seen a lot of other players. We saw Matt Carpenter. This guy couldn't hit anything and he adapted. And then he was great last year. Now he's a Padre. I don't know if it's going to be great, but, I just, that's, Mike, 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 Mike. <laughs> you know, all right. All right. Mike, Don't Mike make me do my Mike, Mike, Mike Mad Dog impersonation. I, I always know when our crossovers are over, <laughs> one of us drifts into Mike and the Mad Dog. So <laughs> that's when we know to cut this off. But if you enjoyed us together, you get it again in 24 hours because we're coming back right here to preview the World Baseball Classic right now. Check it out, Lockdown Royals Padres right for this on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Until then, be good. Be good to one another.